I think we can start. Um, welcome, everybody. My name is Barbara. I am your host today. And uh, yes, it's really such a pleasure to see all your names and faces gathered here together in this digital space. It is my pleasure to welcome our speakers for today. We have Veronique Paradis, Gwendal Creure, Don Hansen, Hugo Pecorayo, and Tanya Schumacher with Jacqueline Seliger and their collaboratory team. Thank you so much for joining this webinar and bringing your projects to the table. And another big thank you directly goes to the Beyond Matter project team, led by Lydia nolasco Rosas and Felix Koberstein, uh, for gathering us today. You guys are really the reason why we are here, so thank you very much. Um, it's a bit of an emotional day at the ZKM today, so um, let me start with a quote. Us museums can be the better Netflix. I will always remember how Peter Weibel said this back in May 2020 during the first lockdown um, on the set of the live streaming festival of Critical Zones. And he was walking around the many cameras and Zoom monitors in the middle of the empty exhibition space of the ZKM. So it's really in this spirit and in his memory that this webinar series wants to tackle what matters for virtual museums. The goal of this three-part series is to foster an exchange between museum professionals concerned with creating virtual museum experiences. The idea is to really get into the nitty gritty details, the hands-on aspects of presenting digital content, both in physical and virtual exhibition spaces. So the webinar series aims at discussing technical aspects, creative means, required competencies and skills for museum staff, but also visions and inspirations in resonance with current ways of online engagement. Today, especially, we will zoom in on virtual museum platforms that have developed specific strategies of online education. The projects we will discuss today all have a special focus on the social, experimenting with different modes of participation, co-presence and user experience. Our plan for the next three hours is to first gain a general overview of the four invited projects by sitting back and relaxing while our dear speakers walk us through their concepts and platforms. And then after a very quick break, we will split up into breakout sessions and dive in deeper into one of the projects and discuss some of its crucial parameters. At the end, we will all come back together again and share some of our key takeaway and insights. Right, and with this being said, I am happy to pass the mic to Livia, Livia nolasco uh, who is the project manager of Beyond Matter and who will introduce the Beyond Matter project for us. And uh, honestly, I cannot stress enough how valuable the work of Beyond Matter as a fundamental research into virtual museum practices has been. So congrats on all of your endeavors, Livia and the entire team. And um, yeah, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you so much, Barbara, for this uh, beautiful introduction and uh, and also for hosting uh, our webinar series. Uh, the webinar series takes place uh, in the framework of the mentioned uh, Beyond Matter project that is a long term um, collaboration project um, started in 2019, uh, right before the pandemic um, and uh, lasts until July uh, this year. Um, in the project, there has been um, different institutions for all, from all over Europe uh, who have been uh, working together on uh, different aspects of uh, uh, something what we phrased as the virtual condition, um, a condition uh, that is surrounding us uh, uh, being museum professionals uh, and uh, artists uh, and curators uh, and mediators of art. Um, and uh, it uh, um, influences uh, the way uh, we are uh, dealing with and uh, also um, curating, uh, creating and mediating uh, content. Um, 
from the beginning on, uh, the Beyond Matter project uh, described this uh, as a virtual or rather uh, hybrid uh, experience uh, since uh, working and, uh, and meeting uh, art is not just happening uh, within the uh, four walls or many walls of an art institution, but uh, uh, museum experience already starts uh, before and uh, ends after uh, entering the physical building uh, of the museum or it doesn't even include that um, and in our case um, the uh, uh, the beyond in the beyond matter project uh, we uh, try to tackle uh, this uh, whole gamut of uh, uh, of knowledge and the whole gamut of uh, new ideas uh, um, in uh, different ways in different projects but uh, let me just uh, maybe show you um, one uh, of the most important outputs um, of um, uh, of the project, which is uh, an online platform, uh, which can be found on the Beyond Matter uh, website, uh, beyondmatter.eu slash projects. And uh, in here, uh, you can find uh, different uh, online exhibitions uh, that were produced uh, throughout the Beyond Matter project. So uh, as I mentioned, we, um, uh, we experimented with different approaches, uh, with the mediation of uh, different type of content, and uh, in close collaboration with the Centre Pompidou Paris, uh, we created uh, two digital models of two uh, past landmark exhibitions, uh, Les Immateriaux and uh, Iconoclash. One of them took place obviously at the Centre Pompidou in Paris and the other uh, at the ZGM. Now they are accessible uh, online, these exhibition models uh, that are not uh, reenactments, they are not digital twins, but uh, uh, rather uh, digital interpretations or models of these past shows. Also uh, curated uh, exhibitions uh, that were hybrid from the beginning on um, are part of this platform. So uh, here um, you can visit uh, Spatial Affairs, a digital twin, which is a photogrammetric um, documentation of a curated uh, exhibition that took place in 2021 at the Ludwig Museum Budapest and uh, spatial affairs wording, Ater uh, Vilaglasha, another uh, exhibition uh, which is actually born digital uh, and includes only um, net artworks uh, from different uh, epochs and eras of uh, net art from, uh, uh, from the pioneering positions from the 90s to uh, very uh, recent ones. And uh, this exhibition uh, is actually built in a game and Engine and is interactive, um, and uh, uh, as well as the so the visitors and also the artworks have their own avatars uh, in the space. Then uh, Tirana Floating Archive is uh, something in between an online archive and an exhibition uh, on the topic of uh, public art in Tirana in Albania. This is the first comprehensive review of uh, um, uh, public art uh, in Albania published in, uh, in an innovative manner. And then uh, we also have uh, two uh, little solo shows. These are projects uh, of resident artists uh, that uh, participated in the Beyond Matter residency project uh, at the ZGM in Karlsruhe and uh, Alex Wormsey in uh, Tirana uh, in Albania. So, um, this is our platform. This is uh, uh, this is how we uh, un enhanced uh, the uh, physical layer of uh, uh, our exhibition uh, or our project and uh, the project outputs. And uh, as you can see, the um, um, the ways um, different exhibitions uh, can be enhanced or represented online. Um, uh, varies and uh, uh, different techniques uh, has been elaborated uh, throughout the research uh, between the partners, which was uh, the point and uh, the objective uh, of our project. And uh, I'm 
very happy to uh, welcome you all today, uh, also from my side, a uh, big welcome, um, because uh, uh, it's um, great to learn about um, other approaches uh, that are uh, similar, but uh, probably on many points, uh, very uh, different uh, from uh, our approach. So, um, Thank you very much. I uh, I hope I'm still in time and I didn't. Uh, Beautiful, go. Livia. On point. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Thank Perfect. You so much. Perfect. <laughs> I even uh, just a quick question, Livia. I'm not sure, but you still uh, host a few online guided tours through some of the projects because you did a whole series of curated guided tours through spatial affairs, for example. Yes. Yes, okay, and uh, so... guided tours throughout the uh, the entire platform are uh, 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 still happening. And uh, uh, my colleagues uh, who are also here uh, are guiding um, in English and in German um, the visitors through our entire platform. Perfect. Thank you for the quick advertisement. <laughs> Sorry, we have a block as we would say in German. Um, but so if ever you want to participate or um, have another look, then um, just go on the ZKM website and there's a, the calendar with the guided tours. Right. So thanks, Livia, again for introducing Thank Beyond you. Matter and uh, kind of establishing the framework of uh, why we're gathering today. Um, and with this, I think we can proceed or start with the first project presentation. Um, where we will have a look at the satellite WebXR platform of the Société des Arts Technologiques or the Society for Arts and Technology in Montreal, Canada. And here to present are Véronique Paradis, who is Director of Innovation and Training, and Gwendal Creure, who is a motion designer and the director of the satellite WebXR platform. So, um, yeah, please, uh, to, the, to our dear audience, feel free to use the chat, right? If you have any questions or comments, because we'll have about five minutes time after the presentation for a very quick Q and A. And we will also take the questions that maybe, you know, are not answered or not mentioned um, into the breakout sessions for the second half. So don't hesitate, any thoughts are welcome. Okay, with this, Veronique, Gwendal, allez <laughs> Thank you very much, Barbara. We're thrilled to be here with you today. Um, I'm Veronique Paradis, Chief Innovation Officer at Society for Arts and Technology, and I'm here with my colleague, Gwendal Cura, who's in charge of our uh, WebXR uh, satellite platform. It's a customizable metaverse for the cultural sector, which we wanted to present to you today. Um, to start off, we'd like to talk a little bit about uh, the SAT. So just to present what we do at SAT. So the, the SAT is um, an institution. It's based in Montreal. It's been uh, merging uh, science, art, and technology for over 25 years. It's really a place of convergence and exchange for researchers, artists, and uh, producers. So the SAT is uh, a venue. It hosts about 100 events a year in its famous uh, immersive dome on the roof, it, which is called the Satosphere, and also in its uh, multifunctional spaces. Um, the site is also an artist center. So we uh, accompany over 50 artists every year into the creation and the dissemination of uh, immersive works. Um, the the site also uh, has a uh, status of a public research center in Quebec. So the team, the innovation team has uh, researchers and developers who work on various uh, telepresence and collective immersion uh, technological solutions for uh, on, under an open source model. Uh, so we hybridize expertise to, to push boundaries of artistic possibilities of immersion. And uh, the SAT is also a training center. It caters uh, to digital artists who want advice, tra uh, advanced training in software for immersion, but also to more traditional artists who want to uh, integrate digital arts uh, or digital into their artistic practice. And we also have a program for the youth to initiate them to the digital art. So um, I'm 
I'd like to show you the demo reel of the SAT. It's just about a, a one minute video, which is followed by the demo reel of satellite. And then Gwenda will take it, uh, or will take over to present uh, more in detail the platform. Uh, hi everyone, uh, thank you very much for the, the invitation. So, um, like uh, Veronica says, um, Satellite is a customizable uh, web immersive uh, platform dedicated to the um, cultural sector um, set up during the, the pandemic. Um, we have set up this platform uh, following the work of the research department uh, in order to explore new form of uh, diffusion around um, collective immersion. So Satellite is based on uh, Mozilla Hubs. Uh, Mozilla Hubs is an um, open uh, source solution uh, which brings together a large community uh, of developers and uh, creators. So um, for example, you have uh, XR uh, Hub Bavaria who, uh, which use the same technology. Um, this ecosystem allows the creators to use free software errors like uh, Blender. The platform is accessible uh, online, so uh, you don't uh, need to download anything, uh, and you uh, you can you can just use like a VR headset, a computer, or a, a phone. So, what is the um, the experience? So the experience is first uh, uh, it's a, a social experience. Uh, so, for example, uh, you just have here like a, it's a, we we have an avatar with a, with webcam. Um, it's also um, um, experience um, is uh, sorry is immersive, so you have a specialized audio, and uh, you can integrate various of content of um, of um, various content like 360 images, videos, 3D model, um, and it's also customizable. So um, you can, uh, as you uh, you will see on the next project, uh, we have uh, develop, uh, developed developed. Uh, features for uh, the cultural uh, organization and artists, such as uh, adding uh, interactivity or uh, broadcast full dome videos. So um, maybe just uh, I'm, I'm going to talk about uh, PAC uh, Pointe à Calière uh, project, but maybe before uh, let's watch the, the video. Uh, so I don't know if it's possible. Okay, good. <laughs> Thank you so much.
have uh, developed uh, um, a prototype in the form of uh, trivia uh, for uh, school, uh, school groups. So the project offers uh, innovative and um, promising uh, possibilities for education, cultural mediation, and uh, heritage diffusion. Um, th there are, uh, of course, uh, some uh, limitations, like the number of people you, you can have per room and per experience, and uh, the quality, uh, the number of polygons you use per, uh, per room. But uh, for example, you can uh, embody a uh, historical uh, character. You can visit uh, different spaces, different places, uh, as a, a representation of the, the museum space, for example. You can discover uh, different content, uh, like I say, uh, audio, video, and uh, you are able to show uh, 3D artifacts. Um, and um, you can socialize uh, with a, a guide or uh, with the, the public. Um, and uh, finally, yeah, it's, the, so, the, the solution is very accessible because you just need a, a, a web link. And uh, so it's um, interesting, for, for example, for remote um, mediation. Um, so, yeah, maybe um, the, next, uh, the next slide, I'm going to talk uh, now uh, about um, uh, the residency program we have, uh, we have in uh, uh, ATSAT. So uh, we set up this um, residency program uh, and uh, like um, dedicated to the uh, to the XR uh, web creation to support artists. So um, the project were uh, selected on several criteria: so creativity, concept, and uh, the the residency was done over several months. So we give technical support and uh, and workshop. So um, I'm I'm going to um, to talk about uh, a creation that uh, is a, a hybrid project. Uh, so yeah, exactly. Thank you so much. <laughs> so it's uh, it's named Présence uh, by uh, Antoine Samor, and it's a hybrid uh, live theater performance. So there was the possibility for the spectator uh, to be in person at the SAT or remotely on the web, uh, so on the on the platform, on the satellite platform. The the uh, actors were uh, filmed and represented uh, in a holographic way uh, in the virtual space where they uh, interacted with the spectators. Uh, so uh, the spectators uh, could send messages and uh, via chat and use their, their, their uh, webcams. So I have um, a little, um, um, let's watch here the video. It is fire the man go. Keep the dancer multi-man. Un autre multi-man. Quelque chose de parallèle, quelque chose de higher. Ça fait des années qu'il est pris là-dedans. Il sait plus comment sortir. Il sait plus comment y entrer. Il sait plus comment arriver. If you want to uh, to know more about uh, like different projects, uh, you can visit directly the satellite.sat.qc.ca. Uh, and uh, Veronica? Yes, thanks. thank you. The, the research at SAT has led us to rethink the, the cultural and the educational events from a hybrid perspective. So we develop a toolbox that make it possible to um, consider the deployment of installations combining virtual spaces and one or multiple physical spaces. So uh, we're working on different forms of hybridization of the real and the virtual, uh, whether in a context of a live 
broadcasting event uh, or interactive uh, installations or conferences uh, or networking events. For example, uh, in partnership with uh, the Symphonic, Symphonic Orchestra of Montreal, the SAT is uh, conducting an R&D project uh, which allows users to attend a live symphony concert in satellite and uh, can navigate the audio scene. So get closer to an instrument um, or uh, another one. Uh, meanwhile, the musicians perform in the symphonic house uh, in Montreal. So uh, all these, this exploration of the hybridization scenarios raise a, a lot of issues for us. Uh, for instance, in terms of sonography and user experience to make it as uh, seamless as possible. Uh, in terms of interactions between, between uh, the people in the virtual space and people in the physical space. So we, uh, we, we always want to uh, uh, create a sense of connection and uh, the, the telepresence um, research that we've been doing uh, aims at uh, creating um, a sense of, uh, of a real face-to-face uh, -face presence. Um, and another, um, another issue that we're facing is the representations of uh, individuals. So not everyone wants to be represented as an avatar or uh, want to be represented uh, with a webcam. So uh, we're, we're doing research on uh, this, uh, this kind of um, issue as well. So we're, we're hoping to uh, find some collaborations uh, here with people who've been uh, working on these kinds of issues and uh, to co-construct an understanding of a hybrid uh, space together and um, share best practices. So thank you everyone for uh, listening today. And um, Barbara, I think I'll uh, pass it back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Veronique, and thank you, Gwendal. Super interesting projects. Um, may I just very quickly jump in with a question because of the hybridization of the real and the virtual space. I'm just wondering, are you focusing mainly on the real space um, within the SAT? Or do you also think about, for example, uh, viewers who may be accessing the hybrid experiences from home? Um, you know, the real space of the couch and the real space of uh, the museum. Um, so... For, um, in the past uh, three or four years, we connected uh, 25 venues in uh, Quebec to uh, do telepresence shows uh, in the performing arts. So that are connecting like two physical spaces. But now with the, the, the development of satellite, we're, we're also looking at scenarios where people can connect from home through a, a web browser uh, to an immersive and um, hybrid experience, like the, the one with the uh, the symphonic orchestra, you could connect from any uh, device that has a web browser on it and um, experiment this uh, uh, this show, uh, this immersive show. So um, yeah, we're, we're, we're uh, working on all sorts of uh, scenarios. I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> Totally. Okay. Uh, also really nice uh, uh, to imagine that one day maybe I can join from Germany or from anywhere if I cannot come to Canada. So yeah. All right. So thank you very much, Leonie and Gwendal. Um, we can let's move on to our second presentation for today, which uh, is going to have a look at the virtual exhibition toolkit of the new art city. And I'm really happy to introduce Don Hansen aka don.xyz, which I think is a really cool acronym. <laughs> don't, don't know how you would say it, Don. I can Thank only you. ever read it. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. How do you, how, how would you say it? <laughs> I pronounce it Don XYZ. Don XYZ. Okay. And in that sense, I'm very quickly going to read the bio that you have on your website. Um, it's very well formulated. So Don XYZ is a designer, electronic musician, and internet artist, building experimental websites, tools, and electronic artifacts connected to the World Wide Web. And he is the founder of virtual art space, New Art City. With that, dear Don, floor is yours. Great, thank you. Um, 
I've got a slide deck presentation to share with you all. So I'm going to quickly share my screen and get started with that. Here we are. Um, so hi. Yeah, my name is Don Hansen. I'm based in New York City. And I'm a designer, an internet artist, and a web developer. And as Barbara mentioned, online, I'm known as Don XYZ. Um, and that's my domain name. I kind of chose that pseudonym because it gives me some foot traffic to my website where you can see all my work. Um, so I started New Art City in 2020 while I was living in California, um, researching internet art and how to contribute to the global community of internet artists and how to uplift digital art to the production standards and the exhibition standards of fine art and how to bring more value to the digital art world. And while I was researching this, um, 2020 happened and then there was like a immediate, immediate and urgent need for virtual space to show exhibitions and sh show things online. So my research path kind of coincided with the needs of the world and New Art City kind of developed out of this very quick prototype of like, how do we, how do we make like digital art show up in a 3D space? And it was just kind of this kind of uploader tool at first. And then people started getting interested. I was affiliated with a university San Jose State, and they immediately sort of picked it up for their students to use. And it kind of grew from there and I established a team. And now it's three years later, and I'm talking about it. Um, so yeah, it's a virtual multiplayer art gallery for desktop and mobile browsers. Specifically, multiplayer is one of the most important features. That's one of the very first things we developed because we want it to feel like you're in a space with other people. Um, when you couldn't go to a physical gallery, like we wanted to have that social multi multi user co presence feel for everybody, and it's a desktop and mobile browser experience. This is not a download. This is not an application. This is something you can do on your phone or on your computer, and it's a toolkit for building and hosting virtual art exhibitions. So it's not just a gallery. We are building the tools that allow artists and individuals and organizations to create the exhibitions, and then we host them for them. And it's a global digital art community. So we envision a community and a, a global um, community of digital artists where everybody can support each other and be in dialogue. And one of the ways that our company makes money is that we're a design agency for organizations that need virtual spaces. And we're a team of five currently spread across USA and Europe. So New Art City allows artists to create spaces like this one, which is a bit more photorealistic, like they've got walls, they've got things on walls, or completely non-realistic spaces where things are floating and there's giant shapes and objects. And yeah, it, it allows wildly imaginative installations. Like this piece by Alice Yuan Zhang is a simulation of moving through a digestive tract that's um, digesting media. So the kind of way that you install work on New Art City is incredibly simplified compared to other 3D tools. You upload stuff, it appears in 3D, and then you put it where you want it to go. And there's only three tools, move, scale, and rotate for the 3D manipulation. And the, the first person view is familiar to anybody who's played like a like a video game and we maintain that first person view for the installation mode as well so there isn't like separate modes where you're, you're switching between different like top down or anything like that we try to simplify it as much as possible by maintaining kind of one point of view and that's the main um, interactivity for both installation and observing the work and with this piece, here's another example. When instead of just being able to observe it like within the 3D space, you can also have a more one-on-one -on -one experience with that artwork by clicking into it and seeing the like the video playback and all of the metadata that the artist attached to it. So speaking of metadata, we have a 3D view and we have a 2D view. So in the 2D view, you can manage all of your artworks and manage all of the information that's attached to the pieces. So every artwork has all of the metadata you'd expect, title, artist name, description, all that kind of stuff that artists actually need. And that's one of our 
kind of driving principles is that we're not just making a virtual metaverse space that's general purpose. This is actually meant to solve problems for artists. So all of the fields and all of the decisions we make are about art. And this is just a view of the kind of 2D, the 2D um, tools where you would edit your space and manage all the artworks that you've got uploaded. And one piece of user interface that I want to call attention to is the performance budget. So this is actually one of the most difficult parts of this entire project is making sure that user created content and spaces are performant. So for people who haven't developed software or websites, they probably don't think about like the file sizes of stuff they put on and they just want to put on more and more and more. But we, we, this is a thing that we have to communicate to users that, oh, you can't just keep uploading stuff or else it'll take forever to load. So we count up all of the, the megabytes and the data that is re required to load a space. And we put in those limits and try to communicate with the users. Like you are kind of reaching a limit. And if it's too much, like people won't be able to view this on mobile, for example. So who is using Nord City? Um, the majority is in individual artists and independent curators. So these are individuals who are doing their own projects. And then students, teachers, and universities are another huge segment that's um, using New Art City. This is really good for media art programs because it was developed while I was in school at San Jose State University. And the very first set of beta testers was all students. And it really works well for like the, the model of a curator working with many artists maps directly onto like a teacher working with many students. And we also work with co uh, cultural organizations and institutions. So this includes both organizations that sign up and build their own space and organizations that we work with through partnerships. And speaking of partnerships, so we worked with um, San Jose State, or no, San Jose Museum of Art um, in 2021 to develop a companion piece for Hito Cheryl's Factory of the Sun, which was showing in their museum at the time. So some strategies around working with museums are to create online companion works for the pieces and interpretive educational experiences that work with those pieces and ways for that exhibition to persist after the physical exhibition closes. So this virtual space is still here and open on New Art City, even though the exhibition has already closed in the museum. And it's a way to increase engagement through activities. So we were thinking a lot in this project about how do we actually get people to engage with the work um, rather than just visiting it and looking around. Um, we decided to make an activity where people move through the space and use cameras to construct a, a choice based scene and then post that to the guest book. So every space in New York City has a guest book where you can post screenshots that you take within the space and you can post messages. And since this has launched, there's been 108 people who have contributed to this guest book. And I suspect that there's probably teachers sending their students to this space and asking them to participate. And that's one of the things that we've seen a lot is that teachers are just sending their students to New York City and saying, Take a look at exhibitions, write about the ones that you're that you find interesting. Um, because we have so much content on the site that in students can find things that they're excited about. So it's been three years so far. Since we started, we're hosting about 40,000 artworks, and 4,000 unique artists have been credited in the metadata there. And I suspect there may be more unique artists because some of the artworks that get uploaded, they net the Exhibition maybe never makes it to the, the fully complete stage and they didn't enter all of the metadata. There's 160 exhibitions launched on our homepage and many more that were either private or not promoted. And about half a million visitors from around the world have seen work on New York City. So our homepage is where all of the shows that um, meet like curatorial guidelines and want to be promoted end up. Um, sometimes people are launching shows, but they don't tell us, and we don't actually know. Um, so these are all of the shows that have told us that they want to be promoted. So some of the um, most important work for us is making digital art accessible, because this is online. The web browser is inherently, um, 
it has accessibility features built in and we want to make sure to use those. And it makes us friendly to larger organizations like universities and museums. So to in making the experience of enjoying that art accessible, um, we've got a catalog view that is automatically generated with every 3D space. And alt text is available on every artwork in the metadata and that flows through into the catalog view. And we conduct usability testing with art lovers who use assistive technology. So we're actually like watching how they use the space and what they need and how we can improve it for them. And there's no downloads, no logins, no cookies, and no questions. And questions as in like, do you want to opt in? Like we don't have any of that because we don't collect that kind of user data. And that makes it accessible because it's just so easy to jump in. We don't require you to go through any steps before you enter a virtual space. And then there's the other side of actually using the toolkit. How do we make that accessible to everybody? So it's part of our design goal is to simplify it into a tool that any artist can learn in a day and to make it accessible to people who, for instance, don't have the money to pay for it. We do provide a free option and a sliding scale option for people who need more resources. And our community of users, um, we try to promote a, a community and a culture of care where members can help each other. And this kind of takes place in our Discord, where we have a question and answers channel that's pretty active. And I think probably most importantly, we actually established an accessibility panel of experts who help us make these decisions. And they're like kind of onboard consultants that we keep um, adjacent to our team. This is a view of the catalog. So this is automatically generated from the 3D exhibition that the artist builds. And all of the information that they put into the 3D view kind of automatically gets um, put out into like a regular 2D web page. And that's accessible for people who either use assistive technologies or like maybe they're just not comfortable in a 3D space, but they want to view the art. And you can always switch between these two. You can go into the 3D from the, from the catalog and you can find the catalog from the 3D view. And then another big component is how do we preserve the work? Because as we've probably seen so many times, platforms do disappear. New York City is a platform and we don't wanna tie our success as a company to your success as an artist or an organization. Um, so preservation is important. So currently we, we host every exhibition indefinitely. We haven't taken anything down yet. And artworks can be re-downloaded out of New Art City. And most significantly, we just launched a, a tool for exporting static zip files of your exhibition. Um, I'm really proud to say that this actually launched today. We are very excited that artists who are supporting members can now take their entire 3D exhibition and export it from New York City for it to be safe for long-term preservation. Soon, we're also going to increase the resolution limits and make a storage space for the lossless and archival files and let you generate the display copies that are actually um, sent over, over the bandwidth wire. So the exports look like this. This is a zip file and it pops out with all of the stuff in order to render a static website. So this, this allows the artist to have a kind of a, a web page or like the what amounts to like a fully functioning website that's offline that they can re-upload to any like a server that they control or like put it in their backups or something. And it looks exactly like the 3D space that we're hosting. So it works exactly the same, except because it's disconnected from our website, there's no multiplayer. So you can't see anybody else. There's no chat. There's no live streaming and there's no editing tools. This is like a snapshot. So you can't like re-edit your space, but you can edit metadata via um, the HTML if you really needed to. So this is a local file. And this means that, like I just mentioned, like there, the artist's work can live beyond the success of New York City as a platform. And this is suitable for re-uploading, self-hosting the work, running as an offline ex installation, which we've seen a few times um, for if like the exhibition space doesn't have good internet or like you don't want to rely on the internet. Um, 
the exhibition space can run a local web server and just run this as a very stable version of the space. And it can be preserved long term. And I haven't seen this yet, but I suspect that it's it will be possible for these zip files to be acquired and owned and traded or whatever people want to do with their their work that they've created. Um, so just to kind of recap with New York City, we want to create a world where digital artists thrive and exist within a global community. And we're dedicated to solving problems for digital artists and promoting a welcoming, accessible and inclusive art world. And we do this by designing tools, establishing systems of care, curating community festivals. Um, our third North City Festival is coming up at the end of this month. And by partnering with high affinity organizations and institutions who share our vision. And that is it. Um, thank you. That is it, <laughs> Don. Wow, a amazing project. Uh, my mind is blown. You've really covered so many aspects of exhibition making and translated them into, you know, virtual and digital space. It's insane. Uh, amazing work. Also, the uh, I really love the different viewing modes that you mentioned. So with the online catalog that is generated automatically, um, <laughs> that you know takes takes care of maybe people who are overwhelmed in the three D space. Because I yeah. remember also, it's always a, a big question: who do you want to reach? And um, especially when when you're working as a big cultural institution, you kind of have to reach everyone. So you have to look for modes of accessibility that take many people into account and also people who are maybe not gamers or not mm -hmm. really used to floating around 3d space and who don't know how you know the arrows are used or yeah so that's really really cool thanks so much right thank you yeah it, it can be overwhelming yeah. for people to to hop into a 3d space if they're if they've never used that sort of control scheme exactly no that's super cool uh wait we have lydia who's asking if there is a way of holding guided tours in online exhibitions? And if so, how many visitors can be hosted at the same time? Yeah, those are great questions. So we've had live tours conducted by artists or curators where there's a few different strategies there. Um, I think the most stable strategy is to host a simultaneous Zoom while the host explores the space and talks about the work. Um, Live streams are possible in New York City. Those have been used mainly for performances and sometimes artist talks, but it's that's more of like a broadcast model and less of a conversation. One of the things that we're promoting with the New York City Festival this year is to include walkthroughs from every artist or curator who's participating. So each show that's going to launch with the New York City Festival at the end of this month has a video walkthrough where the creator of the space is talking about that space. Um, and this is in an effort to make things more accessible because these these walkthroughs with um, speaking about the work will go on the cat or on the catalog view and it will help to orient people to what they're seeing. And just having the artists talk about the work, that's always just such a valuable experience. Um, what was the second part of that question? Um, if you do uh, host online guided tours or moments online where people can join, how many visitors can be hosted at the same time? Yeah, yeah, the visitor numbers. Um, so in New York City, we don't really use avatars. We use little diamonds. So they're extremely low resolution. It's just like three polygons, like four polygons. So that allows us to have tons and tons of users at the same time. Because avatars slow things down. It's like people will want their avatars to be so customized and complex. But if you don't play that game, you can have tons of people. So we've had exhibitions with over 400 people at the same time who can all see each other and chat. And it's been sometimes that gets crazy, but it can be really fun. Yeah, super nice. Uh, one thing I'm wondering about also is the project you shared I think it was the San Jose Museum, the online companion to the Hito Style exhibition. Um, because what struck me there, it reminded me a bit of um, the satellite space presentation where we were speaking of, about hybrid modes or modes of hybridity. So um, that was, if I understood it correctly, an online companion, but did you have online companion to a physical exhibition? 
Did mm-hmm. you have any like moments where both of these exhibition aspects, the physical and the online one, kind of intersected? Yeah, we did. So the the opening event for the physical museum show, um, they had the good idea of putting a QR code with the wall text in the museum because the video art piece for Factory of the Sun has a limited capacity. So I think it it can hold maybe like 15 or 20 people at a time. So at the event, there were people waiting in line to go into that piece and they could scan the QR code and experience the virtual piece while they're getting ready to go into the physical piece. And it kind of gets them prepared and lets them like do something fun and interactive and think about it and start to think about the work and the meaning of the piece. And the wall text that we've got in the virtual space for people who are remote um, or who are planning a museum visit, we're promoting the physical show and telling you, this is when this is open. This is this is how you can get more information about visiting. Cool, thanks so much. Mm-hmm. Um, we have a last question, I think, which circles back to uh, the file size where you said, you know, um, kind of walking people through how much uh, they can upload before it gets too slow. And it's Agnes who is asking if you have guidelines for file size considerations. What is the maximum size you recommend before the experience gets too slow? Yeah. So we do have file size recommendations and we've got documentation on our site about each type of file that we accept and kind of guidelines for that. One of the things that tends to get out of control is 3D models. And that's also one of the most exciting parts of this the 3D space. So there's definitely a balance to be struck with the 3D models. But the reason why they can become problematic is because you need to download all of the 3D models before you can go into the space. And the video art is a lot more forgiving and, and audio art is so much more forgiving because it's asynchronous. Like it'll download, it'll it's like when you're streaming a, a video on YouTube, it only downloads the part that it needs as you're watching it. And it doesn't have to download the whole thing. Um, so yeah, all that information is on our site and we, try as you can see in this in this image like we try to keep the total size of a virtual space like less than 100 megabytes and even that that's pretty extreme like we want people to do less than 20 because that's that'll be super fast everyone will have a good experience but it's always this trade-off because artists want to put a lot of art in their space um so that's why that's why i mentioned this is one of the more the more difficult parts of um new art city and hosting user-generated content is making sure it's a good experience for everybody that does feed into another question that we of, often get about virtual reality headsets is when will New Art City support the headset version? And we have to solve this performance problem first. We have to make sure that these spaces work great on desktop and mobile, because if they don't work great there, they're definitely going to have a harder time on a headset with lower power when you have to render two of the same thing every frame. So, yeah, performance um, challenges and performance improvements will eventually lead to to more virtual reality options for New Art City. Cool. Thank you so much. Mind's blown. Um, And we'll just (laughs) uh, continue on that streak with our third project for today. Um, It's the new digital exhibition and social space of the Tech House of Electronic Arts in Basel um, to be presented by Ugo Pecorayo, who is Head of Communications at HEC. Hello, Ugo. Nice to Hi, everyone. <laughs> and um, I think interesting side note, I believe that the he- virtual HEC is the youngest or newest platform that we're looking at today because you launched in September 2022, right? Yes, um, yeah. that's correct. So I think, I think you are the, the youngest project uh, today. <laughs> so belated congrats on your launch. And um, yeah, floor is yours. Thank you so much and thank you for having me. Um, I'm Ugo and uh, Andy, you could play the video already. Um, I'm uh, head of comms, head of communications at HEC, and I'm also responsible for all the digital uh, assets we do at HEC. And for those who don't know HEC, we are a museum and the Swiss Competence Center dedicated to digital culture and the new art forms of the information age. 
Since 2011, the institution has been central to the creative and critical discourse on the aesthetic, social, political, and economic effects of media technologies. As a platform for contemporary art that explores and employs new technologies, HEC promotes aesthetic practices related to information technologies. HEC is also um, concerned in the methodology of collecting digital art. With these tasks, the museum takes on a unique position and pioneering role in Switzerland. And for years uh, now, we've been playing with digital spaces uh, in various projects as well within its own collection, focusing on software and net-based uh, works. To further explore um, the use of digital spaces, we launched Virtual Hack, as we said before, last year in September. Uh, it's a digital space and also a social space. And it's based on the Common Garden project by artist Constant Dullard, a pioneer of net art himself. Um, the digital exhibition space is browser based and so easily accessible for anyone with internet everywhere in the world. Um, you see it in the video. It, it was the first uh, exhibition we had in September focused on our own collection. Um, virtual, VirtualHack.ch is part of our transformation project, Hack Connect, and is funded by Bock Bundesamt für Kultur, Kanton Basel-Stadt und Kanton Basel-Landschaft. Now I'm going to um, explain you a little bit more on how it works and how we develop our exhibition in the space. Um, we usually work together with specialized guest curators in the field of media art, digital art, net art, and uh, newly also blockchain technologies. Like the current exhibition that is on view right now, but not in the video, but in, in, in our online space, uh, is curated by Annika Mayo. Um, you may know her. For our first exhibition, as I said, which is now on the video, um, we entirely focused on Hack's own collection and de developed the exhibition um, in collaboration with graphic and web designer Konrad Renner. It is always kind of a very tight collaboration between the graphic designer and myself, who is building the exhibition in the back end. And of course, uh, the curators give us inside of the artworks they want to place. Um, since our exhibition space is not a three-dimensional space. We focus on the background graphics and the implementations to create an environment that speaks for the whole exhibition. So before uh, we place the artworks, we create a, back, a background which matches the theme of the exhibition and the exhibition space itself. We could actually do this uh, in a beautifully designed 3D environment with fantastic 3D renders. Um, but as I experienced or as I saw a lot of these 3D online uh, exhibition spaces are just a, sometimes a copy of the um, physical white cube exhibition space and sometimes also a bit disappointing. That's why we like really try to focus on that kind of uh, very true to net art and um, kind of space. Um, and for us in a 2D environment, the visitor can, it's again my opinion, better focus on actual artwork especially uh, the net art projects and don't get distracted by the beautiful 3D rendered environment. However, we do have some kind of three dimensional features um, with the layers in the background, as you may see here, the, the kind of cloudy background, we try to give the whole environment a little bit of depth, uh, depth. but again, we try not to copy an existing uh, physical three-dimensional space. Most of the artworks in the space uh, are interactive works, um, net-based work, 
and videos, of course. Um, and um, they are kind of um, they can be they can be really played and can be really like explored via the space itself. Um, but another uh, very lovely f feature of the space itself uh, is that it's not only a display, but also a social space. Visitors can interact with other visitors when you are in the room and get close to each other. Your camera goes on and you can have a conversation with the actual visitors there or with if the curator is online with the curator or the mediation team of HEC. Um, sometimes it also can get a little bit awkward if you just want to leave a conversation you have in the room, you can just move your cursor and go away and the uh, conversation immediately ends. Uh, so this is a feature that might be interesting, IRL, if you could just go away, but it's also sometimes a little bit awkward. In the center of the space, we usually place um, a meeting room where you can meet and talk freely to everyone in this area. And there is a chat, um, very low tech chat uh, for those who don't want to be seen, but still have questions and like kind of want to start a discussion. Uh, we also have a, um, usually have a recorded guided tour through the exhibition space. So visitors can go on a tour and it's uh, comparable to the audio guided tours in a regular museum. Um, right now we don't have one set up, but it will come for our new exhibition soon. Um, technically, um, it is very easy to build uh, the exhibition space with Common Garden. Here you see now in the video, it's uh, our new exhibition that is on show right now. And the tool of Constant Dullard is free to use and accessible for everyone um, and uses kind of drag and drop <laughs> functions to place the artworks. But since we use this room also for experimenting on how to display digital art and new forms of online curating, um, we use a lot of custom codes to make the experience unique. Usually it takes me, um, because I'm always built these rooms, two or three days to set up a whole um, exhibition. Comparable to our IRL exhibitions in our exhibition space, we need like two weeks. So it's very easy and handy to really set up a cool exhibition space. Um, there is like uh, technical issues sometimes, especially with all the net-based uh, projects. We need to implement them with um, um, with virtual machines. Um, in this case, you see it right. You know, this is an iframe. New works can just like implement it via drag and drop, via link, via iframe. Um, in the near future, we will not only use the space for our own exhibition but we'll use it for uh, curatorial experiments. As I mentioned before, Virtual Hack is part of our transformation project. Um, and in this project, we are experimenting with uh, Web3 and blockchain technology. And our goal is to create a decentralized autonomous organization, a DAO. And one part of the DAO will be to uh, be programming virtual hack.ch within the community. So members uh, of our DAO can decide on artworks displayed in this warm curated exhibition and therefore be part of a curatorial collective within an institution. I hope um, you have now a rough idea on what virtual hack is and how we do exhibitions with this amazing tool. Um, I think we still have time. And uh, I would invite you to come with me to virtualhack.ch. I can post the link in it and uh, in, in the chat and share my screen for those who don't want to go there directly. Um, and then we can quickly explore virtual hack and I can show you around. 
So I hope and everyone Google, sees it. Yeah. Yes, does that mean that um, Andy can maybe stop uh, sharing the video? Yes, of course. Okay, cool. Um, I'm gonna quickly post the link to the chat. So, as you see, um, all uses start at the same point. Um, I didn't connect the audio because there are some videos that play very loud, but you can always like change the volume. Uh, we have always a little uh, little introduction on what it's going on, how to use, because we think it's very crucial for the visitors to really get into that, how to use the space and how to navigate. Um, and actually you can just like go around and explore. There is no fixed direction of the, of uh, the exhibition it's a very open space it's a, it's what also like 2d is beautiful of it you can just like explore everything and don't have to walk in the right direction nothing is wrong or right um this is a beautiful work of uber morgan for example um it is interactive as i said a lot of works are interactive so it's very gameable um I hope everybody knows Uber Morgan, net art pioneers, and they just do fantastic artworks, which are sometimes also annoying, like this one. But this is the point of it. Uh, you have to click through and click. That's why click is done. We also play with new technology. As I said, this is uh, Jonas Lund's race condition. It's a very new work. It's an NFT. Um, a playable NFT. Um, we managed to also implement that very easily into space. I was surprised that it worked so seamlessly, and uh, you can play it. Here we have some other NFTs um, from Alexander Crowers. Um, and a good thing about the space is you can link. Uh, to the original file because these are not original files these are just links you click on it and you go actually to the original nft and if it's available you can also buy it if you want but i think this one is not available <laughs> we go back um yeah we have uh, we have a project by zara friend um it's really like we can play around with like different artists on a, actually a very small space but every artwork has its own little space and you can click it you can play with it so it makes the kind of the all environment a little bit playable here i don't know if it works if i'm oh yeah now you see me double in the meeting point um we can talk to each other if it doesn't give feedback no it works, hopefully. People should pop up and could speak with each other, but uh, we had some technical issues in the past. Um, so the maximum capacity of the room is 200 people. And if you stream uh, at the same time, it's mostly, um, it crashes sometimes. And here's the chat. And Yes, it works just smoothly. Yeah, if you have questions, I think that's all from me for now. Uh, please ask them and enjoy Virtual Hack and the rest of the beautiful projects we saw and we will see. Cool, thank you, Ugo. Thanks so much. You're welcome. Also this little field trip onto Virtual Hack. Um, there's one question by Isabel. Um, is the website showing one exhibition at a time or can you see several exhibitions simultaneously? Unfortunately, we have just one exhibition space right now, but we will do in the future, we will do more links so that we can have a more exhibition at the same time. But we, we actually use virtualhack.ch, it's our dedicated exhibition space and we 
online exhibition space and we use it like a regular exhibition space. So when we close the exhibition, uh, we are kind of in a trans transition phase, but we have an end date of the exhibition that we really can restart like a regular IRL exhibition because because yeah, Constant Dullard um, said to us or explained to us that it's also good in a digital space to uh, or in a digital exhibition that you have like a start date and an end date and it's not always online because people are getting bored of it. And um, so we we use one link, but in the future we will have more exhibition that we can like do on the same time. Yeah. Um, Felix is asking if Common Garden is an open source software or if you made a contract with Constant Dullard. Um, you can use, as a regular person, you can use um, Common Garden uh, for projects um, for free, but we have a contract with, um, with Constant because we use different features that is, um, I think he wants kind of like a subscription mode for institutions to also get funding for the project because the project is not, uh, it, it's privately funded by Constant himself. So we are like also like helping him to work with that tool. Um, but in the future, it will be like that people can just use it and institutions probably have to pay for it to use it or make a deal with constant because we are actually are always in contact with him to like um, go through the technical issues to the for the custom codes because we have a lot of custom codes inside uh, we have custom features that uh, other pages built with uh, common garden don't have so he also does like the website maintenance if anything's happening or he, he, he and his team does it yes he yeah. has a team working for a uh, common garden and the, the the server is also hosted um by a constant where the where the infrastructure of common garden uh, is and um yeah so they are working now on because our first exhibition funny story uh, it crashed immediately when we set it up um, we had a lot of uh, artist talk planned, uh, also with Constant, and uh, it crashed like the whole evening. But it was still a success. Um, um, but it was for us a little bit disappointing uh, because we worked so hard to have an online exhibition space like this, and then it crashed. But now it's on a new server, and now it works actually very fine. We had some some issues at the vernissage from for. Um, the current exhibition but it was nothing in comparison to the first <laughs> hey and i guess that's just part of being pioneers right you just <laughs> you just try stuff out that nobody has tried out before and then th that's what happens with technology i guess yeah so, i, I yeah. see it the same way it's it's new technology is a new tool and we are very happy to play with it and we will continue it in the future and try new things out but with that amazing tool yeah, I also really like when you mentioned about the collaborative curating, the mm -hmm. participatory aspect of that. Love it. I think there's a really cool potential there. Nice. Yeah, we hope so yeah. too. <laughs> and Don actually commented in the chat that they, about the business models, because that's also interesting, right? This kind of uh, collaboration with artists and institutions opens up new ways of yeah, business models and trying to figure out. How do you also with these kind of platforms support institutions, but also artists making different payment plans and all that? So, yeah, Definitely. cool. Yeah. Thanks so much, dear Ugo. And Thank uh, you. we are <laughs> going to get to our last uh, presentation and project for today, which is the collaboratory the digital open space of the Lehnbachhaus München. And um, I'm actually really excited to hear more about it because it was a collaboration, if I understood it correctly, between the art education department and the communications department of the Lehnbachhaus. And uh, I think it's always really important when these two departments start collaborating. That's very not done enough, I think, across institutions. So um, really excited to hear more about that from 
Tanja Schumacher, who is the former head of education at the Lehnbach House München. Tanja, I think now you are the head of education, outreach and communities at the Staatliche Kunsthandlung Dresden, right? Or did I mix yes, them? Right, right, yes, right, right, right. Okay. <laughs> cool. And you work together with Jacqueline Seliger, who's um, in charge of the digital communication at Lehnbach House München. And you also invited uh, Simon Roth and Klaus Neuburg from the Serve and Volley Studio, uh, along with Tilman Reif from the Bureau für Brauchbarkeit, who assisted you with the design, programming, hosting, and maintenance of the website. So that's super cool to also have the tech, technical and design voices with us. Thanks for joining. And um, yeah, collaboratory invites us to roll about as little balls of color. So uh, excited to know everything about that. The mic is yours. Okay, thank you. As you mentioned, the collaboratory is the digital open space of the Lehnbach House. And the Lehnbach House is an art museum in Munich. Um, the, the collaboratory was developed as part of the German Federal Cultural Foundation's dive-in program for digital interactions with funding support from the federal government commissioner for culture and media bkm Pro program neustart kultur dive-in was set up to support the development of digital formats during the pandemic and i mention all these things because i think this is quite important also um, to have in mind how a regular art museum maybe gets the chance to sneak into digital media and um, so the the aim was or the idea was that um, with the support um, that cultural institutions in Germany uh, are encouraged to respond to the pandemic related situation with innovative digital dialogue and exchange formats. And we so we had funding only for one year in 2021. And our aim was and is, and this is the starting point of our project um, to overcome social distance, to create a space for exchange and joint actions, to invite visitors slash users to explore the potentials of participation and interaction, art and education, communication and collaboration in a virtual museum space and may be implemented into the real Lehnbach house in the future maybe. So, um, the concept of the collaborative laboratory refers also to Lehnbach House's interest in collective artistic practice and group dynamics. In 2021, we had two important exhibitions, Group Dynamics, The Blue Rider, and Collectives of the Modernist Period. So I will not dive deeper into it, but this is also interesting to keep this in mind if you're interested to do some more research about the project. The equipment of the virtual space was planned in modules, which were added step by step. Each module has its own functionalities and is designed with a specific audience in mind. All of them are developed in consultation with art educators, artists, designers, coders, and tested with different users. Users are invited to become active themselves. And the idea was, or the hope was, to let many and diverse voices and narratives become part of Lehnbach House. It's to, to go a bit more to um, like the meta aspects of the project. So the idea was to also reflect the paradig paradigmic shifts that defines contemporary media experience, the internet, where, where users step outside the role of passive communal, com consumers and became actively involved. And to have this parallel to the situation in the museum, where we are dreaming of users now an audience as users who are actively involved in the museum. And we will start now with the first very short video clip where you can see the entry, as how you enter the collaboratory and the one of our first module, Laden 2021. And can I see the video? Yeah. 
It's almost without sound. Here's the onboarding process. You can see the open space. And this is Laden 2021. It refers to an artwork slash shop um, by Hans-Peter Feldmann, an installation called Laden 1975 to 2015, which is part of Lehnbach House collection. And the smiley is actually an object in the shop. Oh, oh, stop. Yeah, it's stop. So the smiley is an object in the shop. And um, we developed a participatory project for users where they could upload their own funny, weird, interesting, beloved, hated, useful, useless, everyday objects, contributing to a collective portrait of contemporary society. The second, I think it was our second module, I'm not 100% sure anymore, is the open stage. And please, the second video. So the open space is our community space where performances, screening, lectures, and discussions take place, took place, um, unlike in a movie theater, the lecture hall, un unlike a movie theater or a lecture hall, the users enter the stage to choose their own seats using the, the chat function. They can exchange observations and ask questions. The open stage also features as a video archive. So we can't speak, but we might speak about this later. So we are navigating through the space. And this is the module collective Collective Krembach, which is the youth committee of Lienbach House. And they developed a peer-to-peer -peer format for young pupils with small playful applications that reflect how to interact with each other in everyday life, online and offline. And I think there was already in the back, you can see a painting. Okay, so this is the light interaction, which is just a little gamification element, but it also refers to artworks in the collection like Dan Flevin working with light and before there was another little gamification element um, soundscapes and if you're inside the collaboratory you can hear the sound of the soundscapes but we can't hear it now and the other module you could see in the back was um, reframing, which refers to a painting by August Macke and is a text adventure, text-based game. But we don't, uh, we won't go into this because this is really complicated. But you can, uh, if you are able to speak German, so it's in German because it's funded by a German cultural foundation. And um, we only had a year to develop the project and it was too difficult and maybe also too, too expensive to have two versions in German and in English, but we really had to do it in German. And I will now hand over to Jacqueline to speak a bit more about 
the education department in collaboration with the communication department. Thank you, Tanya. Uh, hello, everyone, to me. Um, as Barbara mentioned before, this was the first project uh, we did in combination with the art education department and the communication department. I can't stress this enough because I think for institutions, it's very important to collaborate inside. It, we always tend to uh, get focus on expertise from the outside, but we have them on the inside often. Um, and the combination is most interesting, I think, to, to do both. So this happened for the first time um, because the resources uh, weren't there before. So the Dyson project uh, and funding was very important to us and to many other institutions uh, in the pandemic as well. And to us, it seems uh, especially important to um, to put different expertise together, to have hardware software. As we are here today again with Klaus and Tillmann too, so we really collaborated in in a, in a broader sense. Um, the main team were uh, about 10 people, the bigger team were about 40, so a lot of people to to maintain during a project of one year to, to keep together and keep track of. Um, and for us, it was very important to create a platform that uh, uses original digital possibilities, so um, born digital, not to uh, transform formats that were uh, developed for the analog, for the museum space itself, um, because we uh, we mentioned uh, and we, we noticed that um, during the first lockdown, these formats, if you transfer them in the digital world, they get very complicated and nobody knows uh, how to do it really. So we wanted to work with original digital possibilities. And we asked ourselves, how can participation be enabled digitally without using commercial platforms as well? So we don't have any login, we don't uh, use any cookies. We try to um, to have a limit uh, um, of, of barriers to enter the space. Um, how can we create a space for exchange where you can really feel a physical presence? This is why we chose, chose to uh, to do the balls, to to interact with another. You can fly there, you can play around, but or you can also chat and and dive into discourse um, with these balls. They they seem simple, but they are quite uh, uh, very faceted, so to say. So, um, but still, you don't need to enter the museum um, to to understand the collaboratory and its contents. This was very important to us as well. Um, although it's only in German, you can just enter from everywhere. Um, most most uh, things work without text anyway, so you can just play around if you don't in, understand the language as well. So this was quite important. But it's also um, interesting to go there after the, you visited the museum as it still uh, deepens the experience of the exhibition. And um, in, in the comparison to the project uh, presented here today, we might notice that the aesthetic is quite beautiful, like, like a little uh, old fashioned, you might say. Um, but we actually did this on purpose, so it draws a little on the antiquity of the internet and in the space which was slower, less data, but more experienced, more, more um, experimental and had a lot of potential. And we combined that with uh, current databases and uh, new technology. Um, so as we, as Tanya mentioned, uh, just to uh, just mention this shortly, uh, it was very important to us to include the users. So we uh, went online very quickly with the, with the landing page already asking for ideas and, and creative um, things we could include. And we tried to meet them in the process. And we also launched the 3D space very early on and added the modules uh, step by step so we can uh, could include the feedback on the first modules in the development of the next. And to us, uh, it was very important to have uh, um, a flex flexible and agile project management, which uh, we included in the funding. So we had a full time position for that, just to give you a scale uh, of, of how much work the project management, management sorry, was. So now I will pass on to Klaus and I hope we have a few minutes left. But so you can dive in, in a few uh, design things. I will make it short, but um, as uh, Felix also asked us to um, to tell a little bit about the uh, the process, um, I just want to just to to uh, mention some things because for me uh, the 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 special thing about this project is uh, the process actually or was the, this pro process. And so Tanya came to us and said, "Okay, let's let's make a digital open space." And and then we thought, "Okay, maybe it's 
uh, maybe that's a bit too bold. Let's let's try to make a prototype maybe of a, of a di digital open space. And finally, we decided to to call it an experiment about uh, how to uh, to design a prototype of a digital open space. Because I mean, um, what I would would be really interesting to discuss maybe later, um, like like what is what is the um, like do do we need a three dimensional uh, space there or or not and that and we decided to to um uh, or to 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 go this way so um i have some some early sketches so the first sketches um were uh already in 3d and um i remember that tanya uh um said okay i i wish that you can uh, throw uh, ice cream on the on the walls of this uh, open space we're designing. So that was the goal. Um, yeah, okay. We used these tools I mentioned, and it looked completely different um, during this um, this year. Um, it was really a uh, um, yeah a, a tough uh, tough process to to uh, to include all these forty people. Um, um, Jacqueline mentioned already. This is the Zine module, and you can uh, you can uh, make um, magazines in there. That that that's a model we uh, designed with uh, Tim Odenburger. And this actually for me like to is um, like to design tools. Um, are, this is for me is actually a part of uh, the reclaiming of the digital space. Actually, and um, of course, uh, just try to to uh, reclaim this digital space uh, a little bit more. So, okay. Uh, I think the important thing, maybe uh, Tilman is still there and maybe wants to share some thoughts. Yeah, thank you, Klaus. Um, yeah, as our role at Büro für Brauchbarkeit was more on the sort of UX and technical part of the, uh, of the project, I would want to want to share my screen. And we originally we we decided not to do a live demo, but I think it's it's working quite well. And a couple of you guys are already in there. Can you see my screen? Am I sharing? Beautifully, all good. Okay, so yeah, because we also wanted to have like this collaborative space and also have the feeling of presence in the digital space, but we deliberately decided against the first person view, which you normally see in 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 virtual spaces or oftentimes because we felt it was it's like too uh, strenuous for, for many people and it's also hard to navigate and we wanted to have something more intuitive and and playful so we developed this yeah this more of a isometric perspective and you can roll around with your ball you can jump and there's also like a physics simulation in in the background so when you touch the other balls they, you will move them away and you can jump on top of obstacles so there's real collision detection in there and it also allowed us to create stuff like uh, yeah like this interactive installation where you the color of your ball will, ref will be reflected on the uh, on these cubes and also allowed us to yeah to build this um sound installation where when you when you roll next to the objects a sound will be triggered so we really wanted to, this to be like a playful a gamey kind of an environment that's easy to navigate and to explore without having yeah to learn all these commands that you usually have to do to navigate a, a first person view and uh, we did this let me share a little technical architecture view of this of this space. Of course, we have the front end, this is what you see. And then we have a CMS in the background where all the content is being stored and also people can contribute stuff into the collaboratory. And this is also stored in the CMS. And there's an email being sent out to the educational department that's gonna uh, see if this content is appropriate. And then it's being uh, freigegeben. I'm missing the the English word, I'm sorry. Approved. <laughs> approved. Yeah, approved. right. Thanks, Klaus. And and then it's once it's approved, it's going to be uh, visible in the collaboratory as well, for example. And then we also have this kind of multi-user server that is uh, generating or, or keeping track of all the people that are online, and it's also managing the whole physics that are uh, that are. Uh, 
that are needed in order to have this collision detection and all the other stuff that's going on while people are inside the space. And to do this, we also used a lot of technologies as Klaus and, and Tanya already mentioned, it was an experiment even also in the sense of what can be technically achieved in the browser nowadays. And also we do not require plugins, we do not require cookies or anything. We wanted this to be as accessible as possible. And yeah, this is just a short overview of what's in there. So the front end is made with Vue. It's an uh, application framework that allows us to build this nice interface and stuff. It's communicating via the CMS, uh, with the CMS via an API. And then we have this 3D engine, the 3JS. Also on top of that, another layer, it's called Enable 3D that's working with the back end where we have this physics simulation running on, on the browser. And then we are using Paper.js for vector drawings in one of the Krembach module. And Meta.js, it's another physics engine that's used in the swing that we are having in the Krembach model. You can check it out. And then the, the, the DigiSign from Tim Rodenbrücker, it's using processing in the JavaScript version for this fancy interface where you can design um, the, your own magazine. And then there's a socket IO connection from front end to back end to enable the multiplayer communication and also this description of the 3D world is, is stored in a JSON format. So the multi user server and the, the front end can both uh, uh, see, the, see the same world. So, yeah, that's basically the technical setup. And we had so much more plans actually to like build a roller coaster or build collaborative sound modules and be. Yeah, we managed to get the whole system running, but in the end, we kind of uh, didn't have enough time to realize all the fancy ideas we also had to make this place even more fun and playful. Yeah, that's basically it. Yeah, we even have like a nice animated logo from from Simon, and we, you can zoom out to have a to have a good overview of the whole space, so you can see where you're going, you can see all the others, and. Yeah, you have the chat down here where you can talk to people. You can see who's online up here. And you also can yeah, jump into this, like the normal information that's stored in the CMS about Datenschutz and all this stuff and also about the collaboratory itself. Yeah, that's the quick tour and the techniques. We even have this color switcher mode. And from there, I want to jump back where where are you guys oh, somewhere else I stop sharing so i can find you Ah, oh, there you are yeah that's it from my side thanks if you have any questions i guess we got a little time left <laughs> yeah thank you so much um i hope it's it's okay tanya if i jump in directly or did you want to add anything to the cool yeah, thanks also so much for sharing the, you know, the software details. It's always super interesting also to go into the, the really the back end and the invisible knowledge behind the super smooth and playful surfaces. So, yeah, really nice about that. I actually uh, have one question, um, maybe more to uh, Tanya and Jacqueline, um, because I thought it was really interesting that you did kind of an open open design process so that you launched so super quickly even though you were not done in the sense of like an agile project management um uh process because i feel many many institutions and museums especially are a bit you know shy in releasing something that is not done yet or that is not perfect yet so um i i'm just wondering how did you communicate that and did you actually get a lot of feedback from your audience um, because that's another thing that I wonder about. Is the museum audience interested in commenting on this kind of process at all? Is that something that they want to comment on or don't you get any answers back? <laughs> okay, I um, just start and you may continue. So I think what helped a lot was to uh, communicate that this is a prototype and that this is an experiment. So this was clearly communicated from the start in the museum itself to the colleagues to the staff but also in all the press releases everything so if you like don't set the bar too high that is the perfect perfect product um you can like start early on and um i think the landing page we started uh, we launched before the, the 3g room was was 
was the game changer, like to to open it up already in the beginning. Um, so this was uh, like clear to everyone that that this is just a, an experimentation point. So um, I think that was uh, quite good, and we got some um, responses on this uh, landing page. I don't remember the number exactly. Maybe Tanya, you can add it if you know. I don't know, but there was uh, uh, some feedback. We had an uh, opening event on the open stage as well. So this was probably um, the point where we got a lot of people there to join. And we also got a lot of colleagues to join. Uh, we asked everybody in the museum to upload some of their trinkets in the in the Laden um, and speak about it. So to, to engage also into the museum and get them curious about digital projects. I think that's not naturally the case. Um, was was very interesting, and then it opened it up to the public as well. Yeah, and we had a lot of chat um, um, responses during this event also. Nice, um, Daniel. In case you don't want to add anything, I, I, add, maybe I, chat, to but, be honest, yeah. I, maybe I honest some. Uh, nein, I add I add something very honestly. I think digital projects in a regular art museum, which has not a focus on digital art, really leads a lot of mediation within the museum and also for the audience. Yeah, that's kind of also why, but even, even if, even in digital museums, um, uh, sometimes, yeah, it might need I don't know, a workshop or something where you kind of invite the participants and guide them through uh, a process of commenting maybe. But still, I think it's really, really nice and interesting that you that you went there and, and did it. Cool. Yeah, we also um, did this. Yeah. So we also did this, but this is one, maybe one of the things we had to realize that it really, as it's like to have a new museum and you really have to, you, to put lots of efforts in communication and um, community management. Yeah. Yeah. Also cool that you had a, an entire post for that, an entire person <laughs> job uh, taking care of that. Um, Isabel wants to, uh, or she, Posted, if I understood right, the space could include new modules in the future. Is there any funding to expand on the existing open space? What is the follow up process? Shall I answer, Tanya? And do you do it again? Um, so we have no funding yet to uh, continue. We also thought about uh, including modules from other museums, like like really an open open space where not only our museum can put up. Um, some modules and workshops, but also other museums. But uh, at the moment, we we didn't continue the funding. But it's uh, I think something we are very interested in in doing, because as the pandemic showed to everyone that these digital projects are not something for one year and then it's done. Um, but you have to continue and maintain them and and keep continue to develop them to the new needs that that occur during the time. But we also you have to say that the position of this full person was connected to the funding. So if you don't have this full person working on it, it's hard to like it falls back on the positions that are already in the museum to maintain another additional platform or um, and that is very time consuming and something that needs to really dive into the structure of the museum and how the, the work and, and projects are contributed during the between the departments. Yeah, and maybe to add it was really a lot of work, even with the project manager, um, Jacqueline and I, we really had to put this on top of our regular work we do in our positions and we kind of were a bit exhausted after a year <laughs> and we really needed a kind of a break and um, yeah currently Jacqueline is not working and I moved to another museum but this makes it even more interesting to think about using the space for different museums. All right. I <laughs> I hope you found enough rest though. <laughs> Thanks so much. Thanks for sharing. Okay. Uh, we are so good in time, everyone. I'm really happy about this, uh, which means that we can totally take uh, kind of an even bit of a longer break. And um, yeah, I'll explain about the next, the second half of the project of the website uh, webinar when we're back in seven minutes. All right. See you then.